through all of that to actually coming back into a classroom together and practicing in, in a social distancing space. Um, let me be uh, quite uh, clear. I mean, this is a global conversation. We've had people from Australia, Cape Town, um, the Americas, um, Europe, all coming in with very different given circumstances to use a, you know, a theater term for scene study. Um, and yet in the given circumstances, there are certain universal uh, issues and challenges we are facing. Um, we started uh, with Drew Mulligan from the Institute of Arts, Barcelona. He brought in his colleague, Aidan Conrad. Uh, they uh, shared their story and kind of the challenges of what it means to be an institution that simply has to go on for multiple compunctions and multiple reasons. Uh, and how they've sort of negotiated that space. Um, these conversations were prompted because Kali and Ira who are sitting there, myself, Hethel from the drama school, we are with what we are going to do. We have 132 students wanting to come and join us. We haven't even auditioned them. We've delayed and deferred uh, our studio program. Um, oh, already like three months because we can't be so we're down right now. Pardon? The sound went wrong. Um, is it going to be a, am I just a thumbs up? Oh no. Your, your sound has okay. gone a bit weird on us and you've frozen now. Mm. Oh dear. Then I'm gonna do this in, in mute and I'm going to try and do it with another um, internet connection. Not in mute, in, in video. Okay. Um, hi, I'm here. Okay, I think, am I heard now? Hey, yes, that's, that's fine, we can hear you now. So forgive me, I will, I will try and uh, speak slower and uh, that way the lag can be sorted out. I don't know why we've had a very good connection all week. Um, this is just sudden. My, uh, so we had uh, uh, Drew Mulligan come in from the Institute of Arts Barcelona. Then we had, that was followed by Felipe Cervera from La Salle in Singapore. He teaches all of their context strands and their theory strands. Um, but what was very interesting was he was trying to get us to sort of look at theater as a technology, as a social technology, uh, redefine the term pedagogy, um, and really look at the fact that we are actually all living and breathing synchronously on the same planet. And whilst we can uh, speak of the old ways and the old responsibilities of a drama school, he looked really in a forward thinking way as to what else it could be. Um, we then had Sita Mani and we took the course, we took the conversations into uh, the space of movement teaching because she's, uh, she's the head of movement at Columbia University. And she really spoke from a very personal space of teaching uh, and what it's been with her students, how that whole process has been going and has been, um, deeply, uh, it was, it, it really resonated with a lot of our faculty and a lot of the other people who came for that talk because they suddenly had somebody who was actually in, in the classroom and telling, telling us that story of taking that classroom online. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, uh, then after that, Amy Russell uh, had a conversation with Chanakya Vyas. Um, oh, okay. I might have to ask um, Edward to start earlier than, than, than I expected, but I'll just finish one more thing and try and then I'll put a type down in the window. But basically what we are saying is, uh, the question we are asking is how do we teach in this digital space? How do we teach in the absence of presence? Um, how do we create a pedagogy for a time of perpetual disruption? And these are kind of the larger, broader questions. Um, and is this thing that we're teaching theater or is it now something else? So then if it is theater, then how has that changed? And if it isn't theater, then how are we bringing theater into whatever this thing is? How are we bringing drama into whatever this thing is? And these are the kind of questions we have been uh, grappling with. Um, so what I will do is give Edward about 15, 20 minutes for his opening remarks, his stories, the questions he's asking. Um, and then uh, I will try and sort out my internet connection in the moderating a little bit. 
but Edward and I will have questions of you and you will have questions of this room. And that's what Edward meant is feel free after the opening remarks to really um, ask your questions and turn this into a conversation versus uh, a one-way direction uh, discussion. A discussion versus a one-way direction conversation. Without further ado, I hope most of that was heard. Um, yes, yeah. Edward, please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, Johan. Thank you. Yeah, most of that was heard. Don't worry, but thank, but thank you for that. Um, well, I suppose, uh, well, I'll start off by giving a little bit uh, in terms of my background and where I come from. Um, and I think that's kind of important because it might explain, uh, you know, where my influences come from, why I teach the way I teach, um, and also explains why I've ended up uh, fairly recently becoming a principal of a drama school, um, which was never my plan. In fact, to teach was never my plan. Um, uh, I, I'll do the quick version because I've essentially been working in this world since the age of nine. Um, so I won't give you the long version. Um, but I essentially started life as a professional actor, as a child actor. Um, I was uh, with a, a very well-known theatre group, wasn't particularly well-known back then, um, for kids called the Unicorn Theatre and the BBC came looking for a child and cast me in a telly and the next thing I know I've been doing it for 20 years or something crazy. So um, I never planned to be a teacher. I was fortunate enough as an actor to work with some amazing people, um, very much reliant on no sort of technique, very much reliant on a pure guttural instinctive um, sense of play as a child. You're fearless, you don't question anything. And I think that's very much part of my teaching now, creating a place where students can fail. Um, and along the way, uh, ended up working with people who have, you know, gone on to great success, um, people like Daniel Day-Lewis and various others. Um, but I suppose when it all became a bit serious is when I worked for the Royal Shakespeare Company and I spent five years there um, working with them. And in a way, although I didn't know it at the time, I look back and realise that that was the equivalent for me. Oh, um, that was the equivalent for me of drama school, um, because during that time, uh, Cis the great Cicely Berry um, uh, decided to direct a production of King Lear and she although a legendary voice tutor had never directed, I think she directed once previously. And so her deciding to direct a Shakespeare play was quite a big deal. And around it was lots of workshops. Um, Katie Mitchell was involved as a assistant director back then. And it was a really, for me, um, amazing uh, opportunity to really learn um, the importance of text, the importance of mining text, the importance of language, all of those elements. Um, but most of my background was very much uh, film and telly um, with a bit of theatre and quite a lot of new writing rather than classical work in theatre. Um, and I did that for a long time, had a lovely career. Um, uh, you know, um, lots of my friends were going off to drama schools and my introduction to drama schools was um, seeing lots of students uh, not knowing anything about screen work. This is obviously going back a few years. And um, from my perception at the time, drama schools were a place where you learned how to act for theatre and not how to act for film and telly. Um, I saw little resemblance between what I was experiencing in the industry and what drama schools were training as far as screen work. But this is a long time ago. Um, and then I decided to move behind the camera and became a uh, director. Um, and went off to film school and became a director, essentially a jobbing director. And like all um, graduates of film schools, you spend the whole time meeting producers and money people to try and raise money. And they all want a different ending to your script in order to give you money. And in order to satisfy them all, you end up with a script that is completely different to the film you wanted to make. Um, and I sort of did all right. I sort of went around doing, you know, endless short films and sort of making a sort of living, mostly doing sort of promos. Um, and I was asked to um, go to a drama school called East 15, 
which had a fantastic heritage um, uh, in this country, go, went, going back to Theatre Workshop and Joan Littlewood. Um, and for those of you who don't know, when that school was founded, it was very much founded, the idea was the theatre company, the professional theatre company by day would train the next generation. And by night, those young actors would be uh, stage managers and, and helping the, the, um, the show. So that was the sort of heritage of it. Um, and uh, the then principal asked me to come in and basically rewrite the curriculum to include much more screen work. And I initially said, no, I thought I'm not a teacher. I can't do this. I left school at 16 and sort of ran away um, to the circus kind of thing. I, what, what, I can't teach. So instead I said, I'd go in and direct an episode of a soap opera. So in a week, I took all their students on their final year course and I put them through their paces of a typical TV shoot. And it completely freaked them out, to be honest with you. They found it mind blowing. Uh, the speed of it, the, um, the kind of uh, slight lackadaisical attitude towards the script. Let's try something else. Let's throw that out. Let's do this. And of course, I brought in all my mates from film school. So they had a full crew around them. But it, it, it just blew them away. And they, they just were, they found it harder than doing a piece of Ibsen. Um, and or Chekhov or Shakespeare. Um, and it really opened my eyes to back then how drama schools were doing this amazing work, which I by then had got to really appreciate and understand. And a lot of the work they were doing rang true from my experiences of working at the Royal Shakespeare Company. But somehow the sort of connection between that and screen work wasn't really um, gelling. It was almost like screen work was the sort of you know, the embarrassing cousin that no one wanted to talk about. Um, I remember doing a class all about castings for commercials, particularly. And uh, there was a, a, a tutor at the time who was mortified that the timetable would even, you know, consider including such a thing. So it's a very different time. Um, and I went there to do this one block of work and I ended up staying eight years. And by the time I left, I had written, which was then a, uh, a master's course, which was based ex specifically on screen acting. So their showcase, which is a popular thing that happens at drama schools, was essentially held at BAFTA and was a whole lot of screen performances. And having done that for uh, seven or eight years, I then uh, was approached uh, by RADA, who essentially asked me to go there and rewrite their three-year course to include much more screen work throughout the syllabus and to set up a department because weirdly they hadn't had a film department at that time. So I went there to, to do that and the department grew, the work grew, the more we did, the more the students wanted and uh, was there for 11 years. Uh, and then was asked to come here at the Oxford School of Drama. The opportunity came up to kind of step up, if you like, from being a head of a department to a principal. Um, and I've taken over. Um, I, I, this is my first year, so I've picked a really interesting year to become a principal for the first time. Um, been no challenges at all. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've taken over, not only am I, is that quite daunting in itself, but I'm, I've also taken over from someone who founded the school and was here for 35 years. So that is quite a big pair of shoes that I am stepping into. Um, it is a brilliant school, I have to say. Um, even though it's been going 35 years, it has an extraordinary um, track record. In term, and I call it extraordinary because there are lots of very good schools, you know, like Lambda, uh, like RADA, um, but they've been around for a long, long time. And to get to the level that Oxford has managed to get to in such a short space of time is a real achievement. Um, and so I've had to think very carefully about what is it about the training here that has allowed that to happen. Uh, I'm very wary that, yes, I'm bound to come in with new ideas. Any new principal comes in with new ideas. But at the same time, I'm very keen to make sure that I, you know, honour the roots and I don't destroy them um, because there's a lot of really good things that happens here. But I suppose a lot of my teaching, therefore, and kind of move it in towards teaching is about you know, enabling students. I'm very keen that we should enable students. I, I as, a, as a director on set, 
you know, I'm much more interested in creating an environment where the actor feels confident to try things, to experiment, um, to take ownership. Um, rather than this idea that I am a wise tutor that will pass on this knowledge and you must do what I say and then you are brilliant. Um, I know that's an oversimplistic way of looking at it, um, but I think particularly with this generation where we have students who uh, are possibly not as confident as they make out, that um, at the same time people are quite quick to judge on Twitter, but at the same time people are scared to have an opinion in case they'll be criticized on Twitter. Um, so how do we get young people to have the courage to have an opinion? To have the courage to experiment, to, to mess up, to fail, and then, and you know, because in doing that, you learn a lot. Most of my teaching is really based on all the terrible mistakes I made as a kid. You know, the, the fact is, when you're a kid, if you're able to turn up on time and deliver your lines, they're so relieved that anything else you get away with. And unfortunately, you know, professional actors, when they leave drama school, don't have that. So, it's, I'm, I'm a big believer in giving our students the confidence so that um, they can change the industry. And of course, bearing in mind what's been going on with the pandemic and with Black Lives Matter, you know, now more than ever, the opportunity to make sure that we are producing actors who are telling the stories that my generation don't know about because they're not our generation, you know. The, the more we produce actors who are going to tell stories uh, in, in ways that we can only dream about, uh, seems to be now. So how do, we, how do we train people to deliver something that we don't know what they have to deliver? It's a kind of interesting to think about. And I'm not saying that you throw everything out. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not immediately dissing a whole heritage of actor training. Of course not. I absolutely recognize um, those core values. And I think they're important. But how does, for instance, um, Uta Hagen or Stanislavski or Michael Chekhov, how does that relate to screen work, for instance, which is my area, is a question I ask a lot. And I think there are, there are, um, there are crossovers. So it's not about just chucking everything away and starting again. It's just about um, making sure that we are producing people who can change the industry. Um, you know, there's that we can change it for the better um, and create a new industry. And now with the pandemic, not only is it about different voices and different stories, but now with the pandemic, it's also about how you tell those stories. And I think that's really, really exciting. So rather than be sort of intimidated by the idea of lockdown and, and all the consequences of that, um, I actually found this really exciting. Um, because suddenly here is an opportunity to do something that has never been done before. And now as creative people, that's, that's fun. That's exciting. Yes, it's a bit scary. I think if something feels easy, it's time to move on. Um, we've got to be constantly finding new ways of doing things. I think it is exciting. As, as creative people, that's what we do. You know, once upon a time, the idea that you could, I don't know. Um, I remember reading years ago um, when I was at RADA, because uh, I looked after the radio work there as well, and the librarian found an old advert in their uh, advertisement in their archive of radio training. And, it, and this is going back donkey's years, and everyone thought it was really groundbreaking because uh, they were able to place, I, I don't quite understand the technical side of it, but they were able to place two microphones in two different places and record them at the same time. And this was like groundbreaking and everyone was like amazed because up until then all the radio tra uh, training had been around one mic and suddenly you could have actors move up a staircase uh, for radio work and this was considered groundbreaking at the time you know <laughs> well if those people could see what we're doing now they would just <laughs> you know so i think we're creative people and this is an exciting opportunity to to challenge ourselves um i don't see why drama schools can't carry on Our, my experience of lockdown and i say i as in the, the whole school um i've been really encouraged and we've gone through the online process we've gone through 
uh, social distance teaching. And I'm pleased to say that we have managed to do four productions, um, some with an audience, most without. And we've got another production that is due to open in about two weeks with a tiny, tiny audience. Um, and that's all been with social distancing and it's all been slightly re, you know, reinventing, if you like, how we do things. Um, but that to me is exciting. Does that sort of give you enough to think uh, to get us going? I can go into details if that's interesting or useful for people, but that gives you a, an idea of where I'm at and from. Well, it's already prompted a few questions in which I think you might be able to fold, uh, fold um, some of the actual stories of what's happening on the ground at OSD, maybe into those as in the way of example. But we're, we're talking about producing uh, these students and graduating them for the unknown. Um, we're talking about, you know, for the industry, but the industry itself, quote unquote, becomes something that is up for re redefining. Yeah. And what we have, like, I'm not sure what the optimism or pessimism is about reconvening into the theaters in the coming three to five years feels like or looks like at your end. But right now at our end, we feel like that's just off the cards for the foreseeable future. And if that's the case, then what is the role of like the production uh, take in that? Um, so, and therefore, should we be, because you also said in the same, in the same idea and thoughts, the excitement is about the fact that we are still giving them uh, the, the systems for creativity and Somebody from a previous talk said that, you know, in this particular environment, I feel like what I'm doing is delivering the material uh, to make others creative. Um, but then that might be just, should we be calling ourselves creativity schools? And mm -hmm. what, what is this, you, you get what I'm saying? So this, yeah. so what I'm trying to do over here is actually take you through three questions, I think all in one. Uh, and the first one of course is, what are, we, what are we getting them to do? And what are they gonna go out into the world and do? If we are preparing them for something, what is that something now, given that we don't even know what the industry is? The second question is, um, I mean, that, that, that is the, I think all, all three questions actually fold into that. But- uh, well, you, in, Let, me, let yeah. me deal with that one. Let me deal with that one. Well, I mean, I, I think it comes back to, you know, what is a drama school? And for me, a drama, Drama school isn't theatre training. Uh, drama school isn't just theatre training. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's training actors. And if you want to train an actor for now and the future, that can't just be theatre. Um, now, that's an obvious statement, but I think possibly what's been happening recently is it's making people really seriously now question that. Um, so I think that's a major part of it. Um, in terms of um, what we're preparing them for, well, to some extent, we don't know. You're absolutely right. You know, what, what, in, if you take theatre as an example, what will happen in the future? We, we, we just don't know. You know, we can guess, we could say, well, maybe there'll be more sort of site specific things, but in much bigger venues and with the audience much more spread out. Um, uh, that before the pandemic, it was obvious that there was going to be much more desire for content creators. I had a conversation with an American producer about five years ago, who was saying to me, you know, why aren't drama schools encouraging students to create their own content? Now, that was unfair. I think drama schools do. But are we doing as much as the, of that as we could? Um, uh, you know, so and what sort of content? So yes, it might be films, but it might be little little snippets of something. It might be, you know, uh, um, I mean, a student of mine set up their own, with, with a friend, years ago, a student of mine loved, fell in love with radio and microphone work. And the only place really to get decent radio work was the BBC. Um, and she could never get in there, as, you know, there aren't very many opportunities. So she just said, right, I'll set up my own radio company. So she did, and of course now, with the internet and all the rest of it, she was able to just put it out there. And this is way before podcasts or anything. Um, and now the theatre company is employed, uh, sorry, the radio company, it, her radio company is employed by the BBC as an independent to make content for them. 
So in the same way, you know, it's for our students in a way to think, well, these are the tools that I have. How can I tell stories with these tools? Um, and, and I think drama school needs to offer a, a moment within the training where they can try out some of those ideas and possibly mess them up <laughs> and get them really badly wrong so that from that they can learn how to do them right and how to do them better. So in the same way that, you know, one of the things we, we did in lockdown where rather than try and do screen acting training on Zoom in a sort of, here's a close up, now do some acting. Here's a mid shot, now do some acting. You know, I said, right, we're going to make a film. And initially the students were like, what? I can't write. I, I don't know how to make a film, I, you know. Um, and I gave them a provocation. Um, they were split up into little groups. Uh, they went off and talked about it, like on Zoom, like this, um, coming up with ideas, just brainstorming. Um, I then had our, one of our movement tutors um, go in and work with them in a physical way to try and un unlock more ideas. Um, I then gave them some sort of, the only criteria was that um, the, the various characters had to be having conversations on Zoom. Um, and the reason for that is because I wanted to use Zoom as a way of filming it, as well as additional cameras. And because this was technically a risk, I'd never made a film on Zoom before, I wanted to make sure that I had enough footage to be able to edit something together. So I kind of advised them technically on where to put a second camera. And the second camera was only a mobile phone. Some students were working in spaces that were so limited, the second camera is essentially another close-up. Um, others had more space, so the second camera position could be much wider. Um, and, you know, so essentially we've ended up in a situation where the students wrote, devised, shot and acted in this uh, film um, with, and as far as direction, not really. I mean, I got together with each little uh, group who had, you know, each scene, if you like, and we sort of ran through it, but it was really like a sort of read through on Zoom. Um, we tried to do a sort of rehearsal where they would sort of be the characters on Zoom and I would turn off my camera and watch it and then give them notes. We did a bit of that as well. But essentially it was devised, written and created by then. Now one of the students really got excited by the whole project and took his little element of the film because they're all interconnected stories essentially um, and actually even edited it himself. And you know, the filmmaker in me looks at it and goes, you know, it's a bit rough around the edges. Um, it's some of the editing is a bit dodgy on his, um, but that doesn't matter. The fact is next time they're there, you know, in the future, if they're at home and the world is in lockdown and there's no theater, um, they're going to be sitting around thinking, well, why don't we try making another film? Cause we sort of did it before and this time it might be a little bit better. And, you know, I, I think that's so important. I think that's so important. So encouraging our students, um, to create more content and come up with new ideas about what the future could be, I think is instrumental. So um, there are a couple of questions that have come in, which actually uh, are helping me also tie up a few things that I, I have thought of here. One is um, um, you just spoke about how they had challenges of space. Mm. Actually, let me start the other way around. Um, so where you're talking about, and you come from this space where you're used to the lens, you're used to the lens acting as a mediated, uh, you know, an element that needs to be mediated for the act of communication. And that was one of the questions that came up in the, in the room. But for the, for the teachers in your school, if you could just share some of the, the challenges that they've had, especially the ones who really uh, thrived on teaching in, 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 this, in present communication, where, there's, where there is no mediation. And what has the journey been for them? Um, because you went online and now I believe you've come back into the present space. Yeah. And just how has this moment of, so with a second year student or a third year student, for example, how has this moment of first trying to teach online and then coming back into the space? Uh, what, what have been the moments of tears for your faculty, especially the purists among them? Because I know there are people here who want to know that. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm using purists in a very loose and, and slightly reckless way. 
uh, but you understand what I mean by that. Um, yes. And and how has that been? And what 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 discoveries were made in terms of what could work? And what have has everyone agreed to to say? Well, this bit we have to leave aside until we can always be in space together. Yeah, the, the, I mean, yeah, I mean, essentially, the, the a decision we took, which has proved really beneficial, was not to just move everything onto Zoom. That that would have been a disaster. So you have to accept there are blocks of work in your curriculum that just won't work on Zoom. So off the top of my head, contact improvisation was one of the movement classes. It's just not going to work on Zoom. So really, why why not? <laughs> <laughs> so we just moved it and we've moved it to a different stage of the curriculum and we hope that we can put that in at a later date um, but there are other blocks of work um, so for instance clowning where rather than just say well we can't do it um, our fantastic uh, tutor um, Michaela um, decided, no, I'm going to do it on Zoom. So let's find a way of doing it on Zoom. So a lot of her classes became about the individual actors or clowns space to play in. So if you just, if I don't know if you're all on gallery view, but if you're on, if you put yourself on gallery view and just look at everyone's little squares, you know, you if, if more people can put their videos on for this, it would be nice. Um, but if you, if you look at, at everyone's little squares, if you like, or rectangles. Um, you know, some people have quite a lot of depth. So Simon, for instance, I can't help thinking, Simon, what is through that door? So suddenly there's an opportunity there for to really use the space around you. Um, uh, and, and so what was interesting is by moving the Zoom camera to somewhere where you've got a bit more depth and it doesn't just become this. And people have a tendency to sort of sit here, don't they? Well, actually, you know, if you come all the way back here, Bradley Street suddenly got all this space to play with and this depth. Um, so this real sort of using the space. There was a very simple exercise that she did where she made all the students essentially play hide and seek on Zoom. So you weren't allowed to move the camera but everybody had to hide within their current frame. So uh, Melissa, for instance, um, hi Melissa, sorry to pick on you, but um, you would have a real challenge at the moment if we were to play hide and seek. Um, Roger, he would be all right. He's got a few doors and curtains he could maybe hide behind. Uh, Megan could maybe get under the cushions on the sofa, you know, and, and it suddenly it really made the students think about the actual physical environment. And I'm not saying it's the same as theatre, of course not. But this idea of really exploring the physical space rather than getting into this sort of, I'm stuck in a box. Um, and some of her clowning work was fantastic, fantastic. And you weren't, yes, you weren't allowed to just put the lens cap on, that, that was cheating. <laughs> um, you know, but the, so the clowning stuff was great because it was a real exploration of the space. So very few of the students did this. There are other things that tutors did that really helped. Like a lot of classes, there was no sitting down. As soon as you sit down in front of the screen, it becomes a conference call. So everybody was standing up. Um, the difficulty for the teacher is that it is quite exhausting because you have to put everybody on you know, the single view and you're really kind of peering in. And from a teacher point of view, there is no question that teaching on Zoom has been you know, exhausting and much more demanding than normal teaching. There's no question about that. But you know, that, I mean, that's just a very simple example, but this sort of idea of really opening it up and, and trying to make the work as physical as possible. Um, when it came to clowning, there was also this, this you know, exploring the interaction from one screen to the other. Um, and, you know, passing objects from one screen to another. And they really played around with it as, as, a, as an opportunity to really play. Now, clowning really lends itself to that. So actually, by deciding to keep clowning on Zoom has opened up a whole new area. Um, and has, she, has she met those students since then in person? Yeah, so then those students have come back into the school and... Um, 
and the, the clowning to all intents and purposes has, has happened, although we are putting in a workshop as opposed to a whole syllabus, a, a workshop on it, just so they can do a little bit more in the actual classroom. But that block of work, you know, it was so interesting that I'm almost tempted to keep it moving forward. Um, the, the, the other thing about space, because you spent some time on that, and it was a question over here, is, and it's been discussed in previous uh, conversations as well. In fact, by the way, um, these conversations don't necessarily stand in isolation. Uh, once you're here, please know you have access to any of the past conversations. You just have to email Shruti uh, and the conversations will be sent to you on a, on a limited time uh, file that you can use for a bit. Um, but they really, uh, they have been all of value, such as exactly the example that Edward has just kindly shared. Um, but about space, and I just want to know, because I also, I've talked to Michaela a couple of times because we, we uh, she's kindly agreed to come and uh, run a Zoom workshop for our constituency here in India. But I could see from her that she's extremely um, centered and grounded in real physical work. Mm. Um, for her, the, like this is, a, this medium is not where she wants to live naturally. Yeah, is what absolutely. I from her. And I, I don't mean to put Michaela on the spot in her absence, but the reason the, the 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 question over here is what about this like the safety of the space and the fact that now our classroom is a, a a mishmash of both this virtual space where the classrooms have windows into each other's space but the classroom is actually a um you know everybody's living room so yeah that's that's a really that that has been a problem i mean the other the other side of you know uh, it's everybody's living room around the uh, the mediated space yeah but um, sorry, very bad, quick sketch. But <laughs> my my point is that we we know from we know from uh, Kali's experiences with our students who went into lockdown, that some of them had to throw their parents out of their one room tenement yeah. in order to have the class. Um, and so I don't know if you have that. And I know that Warona from uh, uh, the University of Cape Town also spoke about about you know social distancing being a myth for the for, for more developing countries. Uh, and countries with larger population densities. So I don't know, have, have you had any challenges like yeah, that? Or yeah, that we, we, ha we have absolutely. But so when I said that we have absolutely, that has been a, an issue for some students, definitely. I mean, one of the things that, that I said that we did that proved really uh, fortuitous. So one of the things we did is we made sure that the course um, had, uh, there was lots of independent study. So although there were some classes that were done live on Zoom, there were also slots of independent study and there are also slots where, for instance, our voice department had pre-recorded material that they would then send to the student and the student can use that material to work in their own time. Um, and then they would come back to a class where there would be a sort of tutorial, a one to one tutorial over Zoom to look at that work. So by, by chain, it wasn't just all Zoom, 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 Zoom. Um, that also meant that we could have lots of gaps over the course of a week. So for instance, on Mondays, there tended to be no teaching at all. So that if we had students who had uh, relatives to help look after or had to go shopping for someone or because we didn't know what was going to happen with lockdown back then, the students felt they had space to do other things outside of school. And that became really, really important. And the other side of that is it meant that it was easier to persuade a, you know, someone else in your household, can I have the sitting room for this one and a half hour slot um, and you can have it on this, you know. So it allowed the sort of negotiations within the individual households to happen. Um, in hindsight, that proved really, really valuable, especially as you had parents working from home, siblings being um, you know, at school, doing homeschooling, um, and then you trying to be an actor doing your training. Um, so by giving that space really helped. And especially with the independent study, because it meant some students chose to do it at night when younger brothers and sisters were fast asleep in bed, you know. So it gave them flexibility. Um, but there was this sort of thread of regular classes. Um, so I think that helped enormously, but yes, there were issues. There were issues. There was, there was a very interesting one where some students have sort of, they'd almost reinvented themselves. You know, we have such a mixed, diverse mix of students at this school. And there are some people, you know, where 
I don't know, the thought of doing animal studies, you know, um, with mum and dad next door is just too embarrassing, you know, and it's just, you know, and dad sort of going, how's that helping you be an actor, you know, is not something they want to hear. So there was definitely one or two incidents like that, where someone who sort of the student at home is a completely different animal to the student at school. Um, and, and, and that became, that was an issue for a few students, definitely. Uh, another thing we threw in is a thing called reflective practice. So every single week, I had a one hour session or one and a half hour session with every single year group. And it, was, it wasn't a class, it was just a kind of informal chat. And it was really, really valuable because it, it turned into a sort of um, reflection on the work which is important to sort of remind them of the process. Um, it was also useful because it helped create that sense of community. Um, and one of the problems with Zoom is people feel very isolated. And I always say that, you know, the, 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 the coffee bar in a school, um, a lot of learning happens in the coffee bar. In other words, you come out of a class, you come out of a movement class and you turn to your mate and you say, what on earth was that about when they said X, Y, Z, that teacher? And you know, your friend tells you and explains it and then you get it. And I, I don't think it can be underestimated how much learning goes on outside of the classroom when students get together. And of course, Zoom stops that happening. So by having a sort of weekly get together where really I was just a facilitator um, and it encouraged them to ask questions and check in with each other. So sometimes it was just practical. What did so and so mean about X, Y, Z? What work do we have to do for when? But sometimes it turned into sort of questions about um, how do I deal with the fact my brother won't leave the class, <laughs> leave the room? Or uh, one time it turned into stuff that people had seen on Zoom that was really inspiring them. Um, and it just became a really valuable place. And I, and I, and I realized afterwards, actually all it was, was a sort of safe space. Um, and I think that, that can't be underestimated. And maybe it was more pastoral than teaching, but sometimes those areas kind of blur a bit. Um, I, was just, I, was just I think that was really about, valuable. I was just gonna yeah. ask you about the pastoral care element. Um, it's very clear, I mean, that's a very good strategy and it came up in a couple of previous conversations. But I haven't asked anyone, and you're, you're principal of the school and you've got teachers uh, who are also going through this and it's equally traumatic for us in some ways um, because we both have the responsibility of taking students through this disruption and, and somewhere being there for them. But at the same time, we're going through the same thing as well. Uh, and I know we experienced that heavily in March and April. We, I think we got, a, we got a handle of things towards the end of April, May. But what about how do you find yourself both pedagogically supporting your faculty, exhausting classes, too much Zoom, et cetera? And, and what about their pastoral care? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not just anything on that front. I don't well, have a specific question. I just Yeah, no, it's a, it is a good question. And I've spoken to lots of colleagues at lots of different institutions um, in, in the UK. And one of the things that is... Uh, a huge advantage for us is our size. I mean, I should say we are completely independent, so we're not answerable to a university. Um, and a lot of my colleagues um, have, you know, decisions have been taken out of their hands. Um, so for instance, um, you know, if, if and, and, and part of being small alongside that is because we are outside in because we're in the countryside essentially we've got quite a lot of outside space our, our our whole campus used was a farm so all our buildings are old barns that have been converted into studios and a theater and etc cetera, etc cetera. so we have a lot of outdoor space so that is allowed there's no question that that gives us an advantage um i think um in terms of supporting the staff i i one of the things because again because of our size is we were able to turn around to our staff straight away and say look if we uh go into a i don't want to call it part-time but essentially a part-time syllabus during lockdown uh we want to save up your hours and then have face-to-face -face teaching and extend the term into the holidays and because we're so small we we're able to ask the staff that straight away up front 
um, and they all signed up to that straight away. And I think they appreciated, again, having a bit of space so that it wouldn't be full time. It meant they could look after elderly relatives. They could, you know, all of that. And they also know there was a job security, you know, that we, we absolutely up front say we will honor your contracts. But this is how we'd like to do it. I think that went a long way to reassuring them. Um, uh, my, uh, my head of courses, who's been here a very long time and uh, knows the staff, who again, most of whom have been here for a long time, um, you know, was able to literally get on the phone or Zoom with every individual teacher and chat to them and talk about how their work might adapt to moving online. So that, that, that definitely helped. But we are a tiny team. You know, I mean, when I say staff, you know, we're talking 14, you know, um, most of whom are freelancers. We only have, you know, what is it, 120 odd students. So um, we are very, very small. So that makes a massive difference. Um, and of that 120, nearly 50 of them are foundation students. So again, the timing of the pandemic meant that I closed the school uh, just before the Easter holidays, about a week early. Um, and the foundation course finishes then. So essentially they miss their final week, um, but then they left the school. So again, straight away, that's 50 odd students that have graduated. Uh, the third years usually go and do a season in London. So they're not on site. So that's another 20 odd students who are off site. So you start to understand why it was possible for us to do what we've done. Um, so let me, uh, obviously, you know, everybody, if you have, I mean, there was an interesting point on voice. I think uh, maybe I would, I would like to investigate that uh, on Judith Hatel. If you have any questions on how that particularly worked or the mechanics of that voice example, please do feel free to open up the conversation in that direction. I'm going to ask you one more question and then I really leave it for the conversation. We'll do a hard stop at 15 past the hour India time, uh, which is, uh, is a half an hour, so 45 past the hour, wherever you are um, in, in the UK. No, wherever you are, because India is the only place that has a half hour time difference. Uh, so, uh, so there was the voice thing, which is uh, an interesting thing, but I'm going to talk about disruption for a second, um, which is, uh, you know, it, uh, Kali put it really uh, well to us at one of our pedagogical planning meetings is that the, the future planning has been, we have been robbed of the ability to, to plan for the future. It's, a, it's become a physical barrier. We just don't know. Um, and that's one disruption which came from coronavirus and, and all of that. But the other disruption became Black Lives Matter with you uh, in the US. Uh, there have been consistent disruptions on a socio-political front over here. Uh, nobody's talking about the economic disruption that is about to sort of be a complete uh, you know, tsunami uh, coming in our direction. It doesn't look like India is going to pull out of this curve anytime between before the second quarter of 2022 is what I'm being told. I mean, these are all predictions. I mean, whose word can you take? I don't know what to choose to believe also. So there's not knowing what to believe. There's not knowing anything. There's this, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know business. What we teach these kids to be ambitious, to have plans. We teach these kids to, 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 to outline a growth trajectory. Um, we ourselves are institutions that need to have a semester and a, and a timetable and a, and, a, and a strategic plan. Uh, what happens when, when, the, the, when, when that is robbed, when it's taken away from you, when the carpet is pulled out under your feet, then what kind of, what do you have to change about yourself philosophically as an individual, as a principal, uh, as a school with its philosophy? Um, you know, institutions that work. Uh, uh, Felipe said this, and this is a really great conversation, but he, he talked about how the disciplinarity of schools needs to be rethought. Mm. Um, and what, wh 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 where? I mean, I know that I, I, I promised you one of these questions, so this is... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I love it. I love it. I just, yeah, I'm, it's, I mean, it's a massive question. And, and uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think... I think if you try and plan for every eventuality, you'll just go mad because, you know, where do you, where do you stop, you know, after the, the millionth plan? Um, so I think you have to be quick and ready to respond quickly to the situation that is developing because everything is changing so fast. 
So you just have to be ready to respond very quickly and practically. And again, I'm, I say that knowing I have the luxury of being small. Um, you know, so for instance, soon as we, they, they announced the two meter thing, we immediately were able to hire a whole lot of marquees, put them all up around the grounds and subdivide the groups. Now we can do that. That's really simple and easy, but my colleagues at RADA wouldn't be able to do something like that because they've got set size rooms. Um, so I, I, a lot of this, it's very easy for me. I, you know, I say that accepting that I am in a lucky position. Um, but philosophically, I think you, um, that's a massive question. I'm not honestly sure how to answer it, if I'm honest, but I suppose, I suppose it's being ready to adapt and willing to adapt. I think we have to accept to a degree that, um, and be honest, I suppose that's the thing, be honest with the students. I mean, we, 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 the students have been involved in this right the way through the process. You know, we're totally transparent. So, you know, we, we said to all the students, for instance, to give you an example, if we're to do this, you have to come back to your home in Oxford, because obviously they all live all over the country. You have to come back two weeks before we open to form a new bubble and be in isolation so that we know that you are safe to come back to the school. Um, you know, that, that takes a real commitment from our students. Um, so we've been, I think transparency is really important. Um, I think being quick to respond and, and being uh, ready to respond quickly is really important. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, does that sort of answer your question? I feel that's a bit of a cop-out answer, to be honest. No, no, I will, uh, you've given me a lever to push one more further and then I'm going to give the, the floor to Elizabeth because she had a question. Elizabeth, you raised your hand, correct? So I'll, I'll ask you, in just one more thing, is this, in all of that willingness to change and adapt, what do we hold on to? no matter what. Well, that, that's interesting because the, the willing to change and adapt is sort of what my kind of, you know, what my work has been about all this, all these years really is going into institutions and getting them to rethink a particular area of the syllabus. And I suppose, as I said before, with, with Black Lives Matter and, and COVID, the remit is larger. Um, but um, it, it's, I suppose the things that have to remain are the fun of what are the fundamentals of acting really. So, so for me, um, you know, the ability to, um, to connect, the ability to uh, kind of, how can I put this? There, there are tools that we are teaching our, our students. There are tools that we are giving them. Um, and those tools are kind of uh, the holy grail, if you like. Um, the, the, the mining of the text, the exploration, the Stanislavski work, the Michael Chekhov work, you know, those are the fundamentals. I think maybe moving forward, we just have to be a little bit better at explaining why these things are important and where they're relevant. I think sometimes some generations, some, some students, whatever, may not always get that. Um, I think we need to be more open to more diverse texts. Um, I think that's important. Um, uh, I, uh, but in terms of what you hang on to, the, um, the kind of, I wrote it down actually the other day, what I wrote, it, this thing of, I mean, essentially we want, we want actors who are, are, are tr you know, when we talk about, you know, actors being truthful and connected and, uh, you know, you, you, I want to see an actor and I believe them. You know, the, the tools that we're teaching is, is, you know, whether it be through breathing, whether it be through movement work, whether it be through, um, you know, making them more aware of what their bodies can actually do so they're better equipped to use them fully, whether it's about um, getting them to open up their voices and explore yeah. them so they can use them more. Those are all the fundamentals, which I think we all share any conservatoire training, but it's giving them different opportunities to apply those things, I, I think, is the area to look at. Um, okay. So that's the answer to the question. I think, I, think, I think it's a good start and I don't think that anyone's supposed to have complete answers. The whole point of Unrehearsed Futures is, is to further question um, because we're there. Elizabeth, uh, please, I, I believe you raised your hand. Yeah, yeah. I'll, thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I am Elizabeth Montoya-Steeman. I teach at the 
um, Edna Manley College of Visual and Performing Arts in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, I teach voice and speech and acting, and I am the head of the Department of Theatre Arts. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk. I just wanted to say something that stay in the air before, um, out of what uh, Mr. Hicks was saying. Um, I think it's important to ask us the question, what do we do? Is this theater what we are teaching? It's very important, but we don't have to get stuck there, is my take. Um, so we are still facing the changes, you know, from um, in March was terrible, adaptation, all of these came. Perhaps I'm going to say something that you already said, but I have to say it. Um, but uh, at the end of May, we just, get through it and got amazing things. And the most amazing thing that I got was a different level of subtle communication with the students, face to face, near, I am here, I am my space, you are in your space, we are humans, we are in the middle of a pandemic. That was amazing. Um, and then from now, this semester is like, okay, now it's serious. <laughs> now, yes, this continues. It's not just a moment uh, that we have to fix something. No, it's like that. So. It's important not to get stuck on the question. Uh, we are still facing the changes, but we have to keep connected. Um, we are still here. That's, that's the important thing, that the students see that we are trying to do something and that we are still here. Every night, everybody knows what is happening in the, in the world uh, with the COVID-19, and everybody knows it and is conscious of that. So yes, I agree that this is a created moment to do anything that we want. That is amazing. And many theater people did that in the past. Cantor did that, you know, creating these spaces where nobody wants to create in that way, but in some way we are forced to do that. Um, so it's a created moment. And also it's important to have an internal attitude to that which is our internal attitude to this new stage in, in our teaching, our uh, uh, exchanging you know, experience with the students. Um, and how to keep theater as a place of resistance, especially, you know, uh, we are here in the middle of the Caribbean, but I look down to South America. I am from Colombia, I speak Spanish, I speak English, and we use theater as a way of resistance. So saying we are here, we have another reality, we have, um, uh, things to say. Um, so we and help to change the perspective of the world. Uh, and then the way how we are reacting right now is important. We have to take a position. Yes, we are asking. Uh, you know, we are in Jamaica, everybody talks about post-colonial times when we got free of the English domination in 1962. And then right now when we are free to operate, we are asking what to do, please tell me what to do. And we have all this freedom and then we don't want to do it. And we are asking for approval. So what you are doing is right. What I'm doing is not right. I think it's important this internal attitude, again, I say of we are here, this is a creative space. We will continue the communication. Um, how we are reacting is important. Also, our graduates are doing things. You know, the people who we work with face to face are doing things, are showing us that they can do things in this moment. So that is great. They were the ones um, nurture in theater, in the face to face and doing this. So they are showing us another way of doing things. Um, and yes, I agree that this space, the, the School of Drama provides a safe space to work and that is very important. So my last, my last idea is we have to create, keep creating community, keep letting them know that we are here, that we are still working, that we are up for the challenges, that we, uh, um, we are looking for bridges of communication, that we are having meetings with people that we never imagined we were going to meet. I never imagined I was going to be here in Jamaica and communicating with all these people in India and, and you know, England, everywhere. And that is amazing. So we have to do the best of this moment because this moment will have an end. 
it will. And whatever we learn from this moment, it will be like a treasure. And perhaps we will miss things. Perhaps will be the moment to say, it was the first time that I opened up myself to somebody, even though it was in a, you know, in a, in a screen, still I exercise myself as a human being in a cage or out of the cage. Um, so we have to keep working, keep creating connections, communicating, and giving that space for the spaces for the students to create and we will be back and we will be back stronger yeah i mean I, that's lo that's lovely elizabeth I, I i really agree with a lot of what you're saying absolutely um and i have to say one of the one of the positives just to focus on some positives in these sad times is seeing the students when they do come back my god they have a different energy about them um, I, I'm not saying I want this to happen every year, but there is definitely a sense of they've missed what they maybe took for granted. And my God, they are throwing themselves into the work now, like at another whole level. Not that they didn't before, but now they really, really value it. Um, and that's just lovely to see. That's lovely to see. And I would just, just also just say on a positive that there is some blocks of work that we have done on, because I know we're all at different stages, but those of you who are sort of new to the Zoom teaching, is that there are blocks of work we've done where actually the student feedback has been strangely, I actually found this easier on Zoom than in the classroom, uh, which is something I wasn't expecting. Um, so the student who is constantly comparing themselves in a class, and we all have students like this, you know, to the person next to them in the room and thinking, oh my God, they're so much better than me. When they're at home doing it, they can't compare themselves. So it makes them focus on just them. And we've had some people who have talked about how the learning at home has been really useful for their learning because they're just focused on themselves, which is particularly students with um, uh, maybe dyspraxia or dyslexia or something like that. Um, I think I, I need to check the data, but I think it, it, there's been a few in that category who have talked about how the focus sometimes in a classroom with lots of people with maybe voice work um, can be quite distracting. But when those people aren't there and I'm just honed in on me, it's easier for me to focus. So in some cases, the student feedback has been, this has actually been helpful for my learning, which is something I was never expecting. <laughs> in my, uh, Elizabeth, thank you for all of that, because uh, it's the same experience that we're having and you kind of have uh, shared uh, almost an articulation of what actually en has ended up happening whilst the change continues to persist. Uh, and I think that the choices that a lot of people I've heard from have made have all come from some internal com compass. And I think that internal compass came from being theater makers in the first place. Uh, not to put theater makers on some kind of pedestal, but, but we, we, we have empathy, we have, we have improvisation, we have those capabilities. Uh, I'm gonna move to the voice question because of a very interesting thing is, is, is um, Simon uh, asked about the extremities of of what we can do in, in our own home spaces. Um, and I think you shared an example, Edward, about, uh, about how voice was used. But there is this concept of like, the things that are lost in this space, despite the gain of so many things, the mm. somatic practice, the ability, you know, we talk about theater and, and all being about larger than life characters. I mean, um, Patsy talks about, Patsy Rodenberg talks about how in Shakespeare, every moment is life or death for any of their characters, right? Um, and it's that, it's, it's not the realism acting for film. It's, it's this ability to really expand into the world. What, 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 happens, what happens to that with voice training, for example? And I'm bringing voice training in particularly because A, I'm trying to dovetail it back to your example. And Simon had put up a question in the, or an observation about the extremities of voice work in the personal space. So yeah, I mean, have a chat about that. I mean, well, I mean, I'm aware we have Judith in the room who's more, more qualified to answer this than me. Um, but, uh, but I mean, there is no question. That that, <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there is no question that there are blocks of work that you just don't work on Zoom. And yes, I'm not suggesting for a moment that all voice work can be done on Zoom. I think that would be ridiculous. Um, there needs to be work and there will definitely have to be some sort of catch up hours, if you like, in order to help the students get to the place that they need to get before they leave. 
So there is definitely a sense of, you know, my, my, my fear, if you like, is that if we go, if we have a second wave, then, then we're in real trouble. And that's when it gets really, really complicated because there are blocks of work that we have not done and we've worked out places we can put them back into the syllabus. But what happens if we run out of time? And if um, you're denied those opportunities. Exactly. And, and that, well, that is a concern. But we live in a place where everything is changing so much and there's so much sort of information that is accurate and then information that isn't that to some extent we have to cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, uh, but yes, there is, there's definitely blocks of work that are missing. Um, and I think what we have to do is be honest about that, as I said before, but also if something is missing, then let's make sure that we're adding something that maybe we wouldn't have done before. So they might be missing something, but they're getting something new in return. But there are fundamentals and voice would be a good example where, mm -hmm. yeah, I am nervous about what happens if there's a second wave. Well, a question that I think Kali and I both have because we're doing this right now uh, is that we have decided that we are going to stay digital till March. It doesn't matter if things clear up before that or not. We're staying digital till March. We right. just don't know. So we've just sort of kicked that can down the road. We're not going to put the as soon as possible reconvene pressure on ourselves. But then the question is, do we plan a digital semester? Um, do we plan a digital semester in anticipation of a non-digital semester or a blended learning semester? Or do we just plan a digital semester as we stand alone and then say, if we get back into the room, we can go this direction. And if we don't get back into the room, do we go another direction? And that becomes the, the question we have. But I think that I, I'm completely resonating with the fact that if we cannot do certain things, then we have to give them certain things uh, instead. Judith, sorry, you had a hand up. Um, yes, thank you. Hi, everybody. And obviously, I'll talk more about this next week. Um, I think my concern, what, what's been interesting, because I've just been back into Lambda uh, yesterday, where we were doing some performance, and those students have moved from the digital realm back into the theatre with quite alarming ease. It was, it was very reassuring, vocally. Um, my worry is, which uh, uh, Jan and I talked a little bit about with her on this, is... is um, the incoming students. So because the virus hit in the summer, everybody had had at least two terms, some of them obviously longer, of establishing the fundamentals of the work. So when I sent out digital warm-ups, when we were working together on screen, they had points of reference um, and I knew their bodies and their voices uh, relatively well. Um, so that is my concern and I have no answers to that at the moment because we haven't started but we'll have to be thinking at the moment we're planning blended learning. So each cohort would have one day a week where they're on Zoom, but that'd be much more reflective practice. Um, but we don't know, of course, whether there's going to be a second wave. So that, that's where we are. But as I say, I'll talk much more about it. And I'd love to talk a little bit about Simon screaming classes as well. <laughs> that there's, it, want, for me, it, it, it's... <laughs> It's sort of some students who certainly are in situations where they're, which we've talked a little bit about today, where they're uh, compromised about how much noise they can make, where they're embarrassed about how much noise they can make. And then you can't actually be doing screaming, shouting and yelling because that's even worse. But I think in the artistic arena, the, it's the, for me, it's the imagination. So how can I stand in my room and scream and what am I doing it for? Where is it leading to in terms of the text? So is the imaginative space for the lens or the camera? Is the imaginative space in my own space, which is off my own bedroom where I'm screaming? Or is the imaginative space somewhere else? And I'm thinking that in order to find my voice and my body and my somatic experience of what I'm doing with my voice. And I think that's a really complex thing, which I will try and talk about more co coherently uh, next week. Okay. In terms of practical things, just if that's just to pick up on Judith's thread, um, what we're planning for is the first thing we did is we decided not to run our foundation course. So that'll, that, they're not coming back in September. So straight away that gives us more space. So we are planning for social distancing teaching. We are, we've hired additional spaces. We've changed our timetable in the sense that the 
uh, current students will come back early and have face-to-face -face social distance teaching, and then we'll send them off site to go into kind of traditional rehearsal mode for a social distance production. And we found a space that's big enough so they, they can rehearse in with social distancing. The play will just be blocked with social distancing. Um, and when they're off site doing that, the new students will then arrive so we can give them face-to-face -face social distancing teaching. Mm. So we've done that so that we can do as much teaching with social distancing on site by removing the current students into a sort of rehearsal mode, if you, if you like. So that's how we've done it. And we're sticking with the two meters. So we've put grids everywhere. So every student stands in a room knowing that they are safe if they are in a particular square. Because even though, you know, spatial awareness is kind of important for an actor, we just want to make sure they know. <laughs> um, but that's what we're planning for. And again, blended teaching. So some, some work works quite well. So like I've been doing a series of Q&A with industry, which works brilliantly on Zoom. And it means I have access to people who normally maybe wouldn't be able to come all the way up here, but giving up an hour and a half on Zoom is easy. So those sort of things can happen very easily. There's a, there's a self-take class I do with the third years. We brought that in earlier. because obviously that can be done. Um, so there's a, a mixture of blended and face-to-face. -face. So on that note, because I do believe in hard stops, um, I need to say thank you, all of you. We have three minutes over, forgive me. Um, but thank you, all of you, for coming. Just give you a very sense of this is that um, these conversations are open. Uh, there's nothing proprietary about them. If you feel like conducting an unrehearsed futures conversation yourself uh, with a whole bunch of people, feel free to. The questions are pretty clear as to what we're exploring. Um, and uh, we hope, uh, and we're going to continue the series and try and continue to build on past conversations. So if you really want to get a full value uh, out of this, please do reach out and, and take the unrehearsed uh, futures conversation from us or past conversations. They're all accessible uh, to you. Um, the best bit about this for me has actually been like today, Elizabeth, it's been lovely to discover you in Jamaica uh, today. Uh, it really has been. And um, but the best bit is for all of us to discover each other and find a new way of, you know, um, building these best practices because there are some universal commonalities that we all have from having had the experience of theater. And I think we can start there at the starting point and build. And now this shared experience of a, of a pandemic, I suppose. So I leave, I leave you guys with all of that. Please, I'm, I'm not saying this in terms of follow the drama school Mumbai or anything. But our story itself is online at the Drama School Mumbai website. So you can go to our blog. And if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, you will find um, the constant announcements for all of the Unrehearsed Futures programs. Um, and I've, I've created a, uh, I've just started to create something called a, a Telegram group. Um, a telegram is like WhatsApp, but more confidential um, and not WhatsApp, which is what makes it so nice. Um, and uh, so if you guys want to keep having this discussion and have your thoughts and keep saying those things, uh, just join the Telegram group. Uh, I'll send you an email. It's very dense, but it's got everything in it. Um, but that's the way to have this conversation. Uh, so you can also build on the ideas through, through things. I, I don't know how to bite size things and make it easy for people to consume. So this is how I do it. Uh, so again, thank you for coming. Please keep coming. Um, and please, uh, if you have people you want to put in the chair, if you have people, if you would like to sit in my chair, um, next week we have Judith uh, Phillips from Lambda in conversation with Hetal Varia, who leads our voice training. Um, so Hetal will take my chair, thank God. Um, uh, the week after that, we are taking a small break because this is our fifth conversation. Um, and then uh, we come back with Giovanni Fusetti and Amy Russell. Uh, and then we're going all the way. Uh, we also have the University of Cape Town coming in. Uh, Sarah Machette, who runs their program. Um, we have uh, a lovely lady. Uh, I don't know if you know her. Uh, uh, her name is Faye. I can't remember her last name, but she's also famous for the lucid body technique. Have you heard of that? So the person who sort of ran that is she's coming in to speak. I hope Sita Mani will be in the chair with her and so on and so forth. Faye Simpson, thank you. <laughs> I'm getting prompted. Uh, Faye Simpson uh, is gonna be coming and teaching. Yeah, so please do come. And Elizabeth, if you'd love to share more stories and, and uh, if you have people that you think could be in the chairs with us, 
uh, I think we should hear your take on things. It's a, it's a full, it's a full, it's a full blooded, passionate take and I'm loving it. Uh, I, I so resonated with what you said. So uh, let's uh, take it, let's take it a, a week at a time, every Thursday, 4 p.m. India time, except in October, we will move to 5 p.m. India time so that people in America don't have to wake up at 6.30 in the morning to do this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I will leave you with all of that. And uh, yeah, so Shruti is there. She's the person to get everything you need from in terms of, uh, and you can just say info at the drama school mumbai.in and she will see to it that you, um, um, what? Yeah, get the information you need, be it uh, access to the videos, uh, be it if you've seen somebody here who you want to talk to further, please just reach out through Shruti and she will forward the mail on and then make the connection for you guys. That's the key thing. It's what, it's what everyone said here. Um, we get to see each other from, we get to see each other. And we, now, and now that we've seen each other, how do we take the conversation forward? and make something of this, seeing each other. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice evening uh, and good night from India. Thanks, Jehan. Thanks. Thanks, Edward. <laughs> thank you, Edward, for the whole hour. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Great. God, manners, I'm so sorry. Great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm hanging out in case anyone wants to hang out. Okay, cool. Good, good. You are hanging out?